now it's stripping time. Ain't nobody got time for that. This is Hard Rock and brought to you by Right Honda and Right Toyota out of Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm your host, Jay Finney, reporting from my home in Gilbert, Arizona. Coming up on today's show, Marcus of Heel Toe Automotive brought his son, Mateo. They hung out for about 40 minutes or so, and we talked about Heel Toe. They're in town for baseball. This was a few weeks ago during the World Baseball Classic. Also, I want to tell you about an iconic movie intro that kind of Popping into my head the other day. Right after this word from Four Wheel Online. Jay Finning here, and I want to tell you guys about Four Wheel Online. For over a decade, Four Wheel Online has been bringing the best truck accessories and truck parts to enhance the appearance and performance of all trucks and SUVs. They are dedicated to providing an extensive range of upgrades that will match any maker model on the road. Your truck products cover everything you need give your truck a custom look and added functionality. And if you need a tire and wheel package, head over and use the configuration tool. They carry all the major brands of wheels and tires, so we'll get outfitted today. So visit them online at 4 Wheel Online or call them at 813-769-2451. Again, that's 4 Wheel Online, the number 4 Wheel Online. So a lot of you guys know that I really love movies. I'm kind of a movie buff. I don't know if I'm a movie nerd, but anyway, the other day I was on work chat. And a coworker had said that uh, his day was terrible. And he goes, someone pl- please tell me I'm going to be okay. So I put him, sent him a message. And I used a line from Reservoir Dogs. I said, you're going to be okay. Say the goddamn words. You're going to be okay. And of course, nobody knew what I was talking about. I could just tell because I killed the chat. So I sent him the clip of which he enjoyed. But it made me think about how great of a movie, old school movie, The Reservoir Dogs is. I used to have it on VHS and I kept it on continuous play in the corner of my room. I had a TV. I hung a TV up in the corner of the room back when it was seemingly kind of cool to hang TVs. And they weren't flat screens. We had no flat screens back then. We're talking late 90s. But every time I turned the TV on, there was some part of Reservoir Dogs on. That's if I didn't have my Super Nintendo plugged in and on, of which I left Tecmo Super Bowl II on there as well. So some of you can definitely uh, jive with that. But that opening scene where they're in the diner is a brilliant opening, I don't know, was it 10 minutes of a movie? All the conversation between Joe going through his phone book, uh, Madonna's Like a Virgin breakdown from Mr. Pink with tipping. And that entire scene is just mind blown. Because they do this big circle of conversation. And as the camera kind of slowly rotates around in the course of this opening 10 minutes, there's just this constant, this group talking, this group talking, these guys talking to each other across the table. If you haven't seen Reservoir Dogs, again, this is an older movie. This is one of Quentin Tarantino's first, if not his first. I don't know if it's his first or not. This is his first that I saw. Big movies that came out before Pulp Fiction, which most people think was his first big movie. You got to see it. It's a little violent. It's very Tarantino. So it's not, I don't know if if that movie could, well, I think it could hold up today just because it's Tarantino. Because he kind of gets like a green light of being who he is. But you have to see it. So if you haven't seen Reservoir Dogs, watch it. If nothing else, do yourself a favor and go watch the first 10 minutes or so. Basically the opening scene. You'll know when the scene concludes. But you might be hooked and watch the rest of it. Sitting here with Marcus Disabella of Heel Toe uh, in studio, which is awesome. We've been trying to do this for a while. On the side, he has his son, uh, Mateo, who is a future star and here to kind of keep him in check. So welcome to um, welcome to Hard Parking Studios. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is your first time in Phoenix, which is great. Now, what brings you guys actually out here? Because it sure as hell isn't me. Baseball, man. Spring training. We got tickets to an Angel game. One of my vendors, actually, as it turns out, that does my website work. He knows somebody, facilities management over at the Tempe Diablo Stadium. And so we got four tickets. I got Marriott points. I got Alaska Airline miles. And it was going to be a cheap, cheap trip, especially when you factor in Tyson's loner. But uh, that quickly ballooned into more games. So we're actually seeing three games. No kidding. Yeah. Um, starting when? 
yesterday. Starting yesterday, okay. <laughs> yeah, we saw the uh, the Dodgers just barely beat the Angels at the Dodger field over there. And tomorrow's World Baseball Classic against Mexico, USA, Mexico. Oh, no. So that's going to be off the chart. You were mentioning earlier, that's, I mean, nothing's available. And then when you try to use your points and they say you're not allowed to use your points, that tells you that there's, you know, something big, big going on. I didn't know about the Baseball Classic. I'm not a huge baseball person. Don't kill me. But, you know, living here, we know that like half the teams are here every spring, and I got used to that being out here. Are you going to two of the World Classic games? We're going to the World Baseball Classic game tomorrow, but the uh, other two games are spring training games. Still with the Angels? Yeah, Angels. Angels Mariners on Monday, and we just barely squeaked into some tickets to the Dodger game yesterday against the Angels at the Dodgers facility, which, I don't know, we drove by the Angels... Tempe Diablo versus the Camelback uh, Ranch, and I think the Angels got him beat on facility. <laughs> well, you know, the, I think the nicest facility might be the Cubs, mm. which is, uh, it's, I, I call it Tempe, but it's technically Mesa. It's right on the 101 and 202, so when you're kind of going back to where you're at, I think you're going to go that way, and it's to the right. Mm. As you go up on the 101 and get on the 202 before you go to downtown Tempe, which is in the general area you're at, you can see it on the right. And um, I forgot what it's called. My wife was just there yesterday watching a Cubs game for work. She doesn't know anything about baseball either. I know a little bit. I follow. I'm a diehard sports guy. Um, but and, and I think the spring training games are actually a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. We had a great time yesterday. Yeah, they're super chill, super lax. I uh, went to a Diamondbacks game when I first moved here because, you know, this right downtown. Have you guys had a chance to drive around and do anything? Sightsee? No, I mean, we just got in yesterday morning. And oh, we right. went okay. straight to uh, Tyson's place and straight to the game and then uh, came back uh, to the hotel. And that, that was our day pretty much. Had dinner with uh, with a couple of guys last night. But we really haven't done much of that. That's why I was a moment late getting here because we did a drive-by. The uh, I mean, you guys were five minutes or whatever. Like, you were barely <laughs> late. You know, I, yeah. we run on Hawaii time around here. That's good. Um, so Tyson, everybody comes into town to see Tyson's collection what did you think oh i thought it was great it's pretty cool yeah, his cars are all very nice uh the garage is very nicely set up it was funny because we got to his house and i told mateo i said he's got a garage like ours right because you know we've got quite a collection of cars too although tyson's garage arrangement is quite a bit different than mine you know i could tell that he doesn't do any of the work on his cars in that garage um but, you know, ours is kind of a working garage. We've got some storage and some fitness stuff out there. I would love to have it as polished and nice looking as he does. Right. But It's like a showroom. Yeah, the reality is, is half my cars aren't registered or running. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the other half of them are outside. So my garage is only so impressive. It's just large. So Tyson's a little, he's a little insane. You know, he's, he's, he's a one-man shop moving these cars around all the time like little Tesla pieces to get to one. It's I don't know. I don't know how he does it. And then he has that extra space on the other side of the garage too. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. his, his overflow storage. And then did he tell you he stores at least one car at Acura of Tempe? Mm, yeah, well, I didn't see a couple of cars, which, you know, he did allude to that they were elsewhere. Yeah, the so, S2000 yeah. is at Acura of Tempe. And any, at any given time, they have – Two of his cars. That's where I bought my NSX. Um, so, hmm. what do you have? What do you have at home? Well, my probably my number one is my TSX. I have a 2004 TSX that I've completely customized. Custom paint, interior's been changed. Um, actually, the engine is pretty stock, but for the most part, it's kind of my most invested in car. And uh, my wife has an S2000. Mm -hmm. um, we have the NA1. NSX, silver. I got a 2010 TL six-speed. That's kind of our daily runabout, the airport car, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an 85 CRX, which is kind of a neat car. That was a gray market import that Oscar Jackson brought in in 1986. So I'm doing sort of a resto mod on that. That's taking way too long. He brought it in in 86? He brought it in in 86 as a new car. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's a whole conversation in itself, but um, but it's going to be a banger when it's done. It's mostly done. I've just kind of run out of, run out of talent on that, and I have to figure out how to finish it 
uh, with time constraints and whatnot. But um, a lot of people that know me know know about that car anyway. Uh, but uh, let's see. I also got an 87 Civic hatchback. Well, we got the Type S, of course. Uh, we got the first one that Tonkin Acura had brought in. We got their demo. That's so a TLX Type S. TLX Type S, yeah. Been playing with that for a little while. And then we've got an Odyssey, which is, you know. You have thing. a lot of cars. Oh, yeah. You have a lot of cars in your yeah. garage. And the Excursion, which comes last because it's not a Honda product. <laughs> but it's bigger uh-huh. than anything else that you've mentioned. Well, yeah, because for towing. Right. Yeah, that's the only reason why I have that. Now, do you have like a big space? Do you have like a, is it like a pole barn type setup or is it like a We have an RV house? garage. Okay. So oh, we, my God. When we so built nice. our house, Must be nice. um, it was new. It was a new construction. And so it came with a three-car tandem. Mm-hmm. And then we just bumped out the side with an RV garage. So I can go three cars nose to tail in the RV section, and then I've got two others in the two car area, and then the rest are all outside, mm. which um, isn't awesome, but right, uh, you know, whatever. I don't My tandem know. is that the one, and then the second one that's double deep. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we looked at some of those out here before we moved out here, so. What two years ago is that when we met? Two and a half years ago was was, was it Portland or before Portland? Uh, I feel like it, it was, right, was the... right around then. Um, it might have been just after that because yeah, I think we really got to chatting in the uh, cocktail reception. In Monterey. Um, no, at at Portland. Portland. That's where okay. we kind of like um, chatted a little bit. We had that little breakout with Mark, and then uh, and then oh, went, that's right, the little yeah, little breakout room. I think that might have been the first. <laughs> you know, more intimate chat that we had. But after that, then, yeah, we linked up in Monterey and then, you know. So it's taken this guy two years to come on this show. <laughs> and originally it's, you know, I want to talk to you about your TLX Type S. Which, which I had we, which, there. I had it at NSX yeah. Expo, yeah. And uh, which we can, we can still do. I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. Yeah. Because you're old school. You have to be. Uh-huh. Because you're setting this whole thing up via email. And I'm thinking, God, I have this guy's phone number. <laughs> friends on social media, and we're setting our times, and everything on an email, you know. But some people are like that. You have that's how they they set their schedule. Um, but I was like, God, how old is this guy? Well, so here's the thing: I, I'm old enough to understand that the different forms of electronic communication have a place, right? Yeah, we can chat, we can line up over over text. You could talk me in. We can make an appointment tentative, or like the day of activities is great for text, right? Or if you don't have my text, you can message me on some other platform. But if something's got to get done, it's got to go in an email. Because otherwise, uh, you know, texts come and go. You know, I get too many of them. So that goes, right, that goes kind of the whole classic thing. It's like your the typical office. It's like, did you get it in an email? Capture it in an email. Well, Marcus said this. He said it on a call, but did you get it in an email? It's like, no. Well, then you can't hold it. You know? Yeah. Half of my calls and my texts with customers are like either answering their question or telling them to email me. And it's, I think it might be annoying to some people, but the reality is I'm one guy. Sure. And I get a lot of communications. And All right. Fair enough. You know? Yeah. Fair enough. Because I've complained about that, not with you, but I've complained about the people trying to get a hold of me, but they send me Facebook messages or yeah. Instagram messages like, hey, man, are you busy tomorrow? And I'm like, dude, if you want me, you, you have, well, in your case, I'm, I tell people, like, you have my phone number, call or text me because I'm always on my phone. Um, but this is the other thing. So nothing's more solid than captured on email. You know, mm-hmm. someday you won't even probably have to deal with email. Yeah, that's how uh, that's how this world. Was, and I'm talking to Mateo over here, and he kind of snickered at me, <laughs> like you guys are so old and antiquated. You know, it's funny that he does have an email account, a Google account. Uh, you know, for half of the you know apps and stuff that he's got. Um, but I keep wanting to email him articles and stuff, but he doesn't log in and check his email. So I got mm, to sure. <laughs> teach him how to do that. I tell you, man, it, it's interesting that that dynamic in dealing with younger people and it's changing so so quickly. You know, like my kids are pretty much grown. Well, they're grown. And even my son, he's kind of an old soul. So he's kind of antiquated like that. He's always been. My daughter's like, you know, she's she's moving in life at 100 miles an hour. And, you know, if you want to get a hold of her for anything, you have to send her a text. Like I'll never send her an email for anything because I know that she doesn't, you know, communicate that way. So I think it's just kind of 
trying to adjust to what works. And meanwhile, my grandson, yeah, I did say grandson, he's watching stuff and he's like, hey, I want to see monster trucks. And I'm like, I pull up monster trucks on YouTube and before the first one jumps, he's always cl he's already clicking on one of the other previews. Yeah. You know, I'm like, dude, that's clickbait. You see it jumping, then you have to wait for it to jump, you know, and he's just like, bam, bam, bam. So it's it's uh, pretty nutsy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is different. And we've gotten my older son acclimated to the email pretty well. He's come to I was to just learn. getting ready to ask if Mateo's the only. No, no. I have a soon-to-be 17-year-old also. He'll be 17 next month. Actually taking his SAT today. Okay. Um, but, yeah, just in organizing that, some of the other things that he wants to do, like – you got to email, right? We'll send them, you know, the teachers email out stuff. Yeah, they, they'll yeah. email us, but it's like email him. You know, he's <laughs> the one that's got to do it. Right. And uh, you know, he's well, he's gotten better at, at working with email. You know, and which is good. But he won't he won't go near uh, Facebook at all. He's just staunchly against it. How are you on social media, just in general? I do it because I have to at this point. For for the business? Yeah, for the most part. And yeah. also, it is a good way to to just sort of share experiences and things. And so what I'm finding now is a lot of, you know, you get a lot of joy in some of the things that you shared that Facebook reminds you that you did seven yep. years ago or whatever. And so I do try to drop just sort of breadcrumbs of fun things like this trip and whatever. We're, I'll be posting some of it up because at some point it would be nice to have it flashed back again. I think that's probably the best thing that I'm getting out of Facebook right now. But um, I don't know. I think that there's a, I don't know, there's a there's a practical limit to what these platforms are really good for. Right. And the more and more they try to turn them into like, you know, marketing enterprises or like advertising platforms, you just really are losing the purity of what, you really want out of it, which is the communication with other people. Yeah. And so they've infected it with so much, like, uh, you know, revenue generating, uh, like, they're trying to keep you on and addicted and all this stuff. It's just, you feel it, and it feels like this sucks. And so I'm not surprised my son doesn't want anything to do with it. But uh, I don't know. Like I said, I'm on there because people use it. So... You, know. you kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say you kind of have to, but you kind of have to, but I think you've learned, and this is the key in all social media, and I'll tell you this, and I'm looking at Mateo here, um, you have to learn how to navigate mm. and use it correctly. And it's really hard because it becomes an obsessive thing. You know, I'm, I'm on my phone all the time, whether I'm playing video games or, or I'm on Instagram probably more than anything else, mm -hmm. but it's never like I'm living my best life. I'm just doing stuff. And then as I post, I kind of look back. I'm like, man, it looks like I'm living my best life. You know, let me let me post some reality here. You know, here's my McDonald's. It's not this expensive steak dinner that is actually on someone else's dime, but it's part of this all inclusive resort. Yeah, reel. E yeah, exactly. The highlight reel, uh, the, the concept that's been there for a long time, is is really seriously true. It brings a you know this inadequacy in other people that makes them you feel can. like they're not doing a steak yeah. dinner today too. It's like well, exactly, you had one last week, man. I didn't. Right. Um, but you know you don't see that, right? So running running everything you see through the filter of reality is is important. Yeah, and I, I, I like Facebook only to kind of, kind of like you. Yeah, I mean, I use it to keep in touch with people. I use yeah. it for groups because some people only communicate, you know, on Facebook, and you have feel like you have to have a. Like, and we'll get into it in a minute, but we have to have a, I'm sure there's a heel toe page on Facebook. Yeah. yeah you know, I'm glad just, you mentioned it. Yeah. yeah. Got taken over by somebody else last September. We got kicked out as admins and it's been showing like Cosby show reels. Still? Still, bro. Oh, like, that, oh my God. And we've engaged with them, we're attempted to engage with them as many ways as we can. And really we just have one ticket open and, you know, right in there they laid off, I don't know, some ungodly amount of people so i don't know if it's a workload thing or what but they still haven't given us access to the page back and i would say that that whole experience has just really shaken my interest in even being on the platform at all i'm still there i kind of re this was recent right toward the end of last yeah, year yeah I well remember. now it's been like five months yeah i remember more. those posts yeah oh my god you're right yeah and i would just write it off Right. See, oh, why don't you just start a new page? Like, yeah, sure, I can. I have another name parked that I can mm -hmm. use. But that doesn't change the fact that that page has still got my name on it. It's still linked to my domain. Mm. And so now anytime I try to share any hyperlinks to my website, 
they all get pulled down for community standard violation because of too many people reporting the other page. So I, I'm kind of screwed. They have to fix it. Right. I don't care if they delete it at this point. It's just, but I can't have it be up. And I don't see the value in starting a new one. Sure. Um, you had mentioned maybe memories and looking back. That's what I use Instagram for a lot. And it is fun every once in a while I get a Facebook. This is what you were doing 10 years ago. And I'm looking at it. It's like, what the heck? I actually mm. deleted something the other day that was Ooh. brought back as a memory. I go, man, I was making fun of this situation <laughs> 10 years ago. I don't, don't want really that want to, to keep popping that. up. Let me go ahead and delete this post. And it was, it was, it wasn't, I mean, it's borderline cancel culture stuff. But I try to be, you know, really, you know, headsy about the things that I post. But I'm thinking of like highlights. I'm pointing to a picture of Izzy. The dog at the end of every episode up there because he passed last year. And then on my my travels page Instagram, I started creating a highlight reel for him probably seven years ago. And so now anytime I want to see my you know deceased dog, I just go back and watch the highlight reel. Mm. And so, you know, that's kind of the good of some of the social media. And it just kind of goes back to, you know, however you want to use it appropriately. Let's talk about heel toe. Well, first, tell me about your TLX Type S. Let's yeah, go back to two, year, point, two years right? ago. Yeah, <laughs> it was originally, yeah. Yeah. Well, we bought this car. Um, well, I was there at the at the concept reveal, the Type S concept, and everybody was just enamored with that shape mm -hmm. and the design language, and uh, and the whole thing. Um, man, they really knocked it out of the park. I think with that design concept. That and was the blue car. The blue car, yep. yeah, Monterey. And then um, when that became the prototype, and then the production car, I could not believe how close to. I mean, you never see a production car look as much like the concept. Now, granted, they had to change a lot of things, and we all know the the menu. You know, you can't have twenty two inch wheels, and there has to be a bumper behind the sure. bumper and yeah. all that. That being said, the design and language came through so clearly. It was like I was able to buy that car, and it was like so cool. And um, unlike the Supra to the FT one, <laughs> yeah, I mean. I don't know. I don't really pay attention to the other cars. Okay. Not yeah, based accurate. on your garage, it sounds like, yeah. Yeah, I don't really care about other cars. Uh, I what don't are you have... teaching this kid? <laughs> well, right now I'm teaching him baseball stuff. All right, good. But I'm learning that too. So he's teaching me how to be a baseball dad. Okay. We're, we're, we're learning how to hit. That's what we're learning over here. So the, the, the baseball itself is a whole other conversation. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I really liked mm -hmm. the way the car looked. And being in the business of Honda and Acura parts, and becoming more and more accurate over time, that NSX really kind of plunked me into this whole other world that y'all you know, NSX guys are sort of like, you know, level up Honda Acura people. Um, it was kind That's of a like, good point. yeah, it's a, well, it's a different community. I've been in Honda Acura community since I could drive, right? Um, you know, in the mid '90s now. But uh, by getting the NSX, it's kind of like, well, there's a whole other group of people that is maybe more NSX than the rest of the lineup, but Really, actually, the kind of credence that Acura gives the NSX group mm -hmm. kind of um, exposed me to a little bit more of what, you know, some of the workings of Acura is about. But anyway, um, having formulated a really good relationship with the dealer in Portland there, um, we were on the short list of contacts. We put in a deposit pretty early for one. We actually were second in line behind Ira, but he refused the first car because it didn't have the Orchid interior. So we took it. And um, I took it to get an exhaust made. We had... Um, what color is yours? The Tiger Eye. It's Tiger Eye as well. Yeah, okay. with the black inside. That's the perf That's the right combo, by I the think, way. I think it's great. Yeah, that with Orchid seems weird. Mm, yeah, I think the Orchid is probably good for some people, but not me. Right. Um, yeah, so we, we got it mostly because we wanted to develop some stuff for it and just have the new... We never buy new cars, really, mm -hmm. so it was really kind of a cool... Car to jump on, and the, like I said, the dealer was super accommodating. The general manager at the time was, um, I mean, we were getting a live stream of where's the car, and here it is, and sure. blah, blah, blah. And uh, given that it was their demo, we couldn't actually take delivery until sometime later. I think it's like 60 days. Um, but he actually let us have the car for most of the time anyway. So, I think I kind of remember that. So yeah. how was it – I mean – is there anything you could compare it to? I know you're Honda Acura through and through, um, but 
I mean, you, you you still have it. Are you developing parts for it? You love driving it. You, yeah. You know, how do you ever get to drive it, given you have like 30 cars? Well, uh, my wife drives it pretty much every day. At okay. least drives it uh, all the time. Um, she's really adopted it and like loves it. Um, but we did, I did have it in California for the better part of a year, getting some mm-hmm. stuff developed. And we do have, let's see, we did springs with Tane and we did our own exhaust, which just got released. And the exhaust system so far is, is getting some really good feedback. Um, I'm doing a spoiler for it now too, sort of a ground up design. And that I think is going to be pretty neat. I don't know how much I'll do beyond that. Maybe some more carbon stuff for the outside. So but it's more OEM plus with some nice with other things. That's kind of our things. style yeah. anyway. Yeah. You know, I'm not really – I don't like doing garish sort of trendy things. You so know, no, no Rocket Bunny TLX Type S in your future? No. Uh, I know how cool people would think that that would be. But ultimately – That's just some – yeah. Yeah. Pe- people. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, I'm not – I'm not trying to put cars together or parts or catalogs together for 5% of the people, you know. Right. And also, the exhaust system was a big investment for us. It's the most complex one we've ever done. But I'm going to be selling it 10 years from now. So, you know, we have TL Type S exhaust systems that we still can't keep in stock from the 0708 model. Nice. And, you know, thinking farther down the line, like, not everybody wants, like, some garish over-the-top thing. Yeah, I agree. So talk to me about heel toe. Yeah, well, we're an e-commerce Honda Acura parts company. I started in 2002, just sort of. It's been a while. It's been a long time. There's a few companies that are older than mine that are still around, but not that many. Right. But we've been um, on the smaller side and sort of mm-hmm. slow growth kind of thing. And we've never had a year of retraction except for, I would say, after COVID. We boomed in COVID and things kind of got a little more. Weird, more. right? People either, like, completely sunk or they flourished. Well, in our industry, it didn't surprise me at all. Because you got all these people who, Sitting around. first of all, aren't shy about spending <laughs> disposable income. Right. Even if it's not actually disposable. Any recession that I've been through has taught me that people that buy car parts don't buy them. Yeah, it's a necessity modifying a car. Like, right. It helped me understand that what I add to the world and the economy is motivation for people to work and earn money so that they can have fun with things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a long way to get around to what do you add to society? Nobody really needs a souped up exhaust system, but sometimes people do to get them in the car to get to work, you know? Right. So reality is that if you do a good job and you have a good product and you provide good service, you won't have problems selling stuff in hard times. But here we are in a market where everybody was told literally not to drive their car. And by the way, here's a bunch of extra money. Sure. And um, and it was already springtime mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah. And so that's our biggest season anyway. And it was like overnight. I mean, we got a deposit in our account. And I said, dude, I need to send out an email blast like tonight. I sent one out and it was like a light switch. Um, sales just skyrocketed. So you didn't squander it; you used it to flourish. You're, you're, a, you're. A, well, we never shut only a down. Few percenters. We yeah. never shut down at all. We were, we were considering ourselves an essential service as providing automotive par- sure. parts, yeah. transportation support, and then we're also a UPS access point in our local community. And because UPS oh, was nice. a, UPS was a uh, essential service. Also, we mm-hmm. had to stay open. Yep. And, um, yeah, we worked harder than ever. Yeah, so because of that, you know, we had a banner year, but, you know, it pulled back after that. That's the only time that we really had gone down in sales. But, you know, these really slow, confident, but firm steps forward have kind of kept us slowly on a growth path. And, and you know, we look now and it's like, well, it's a pretty substantial business that we run. Um, we're pretty well known now. It's been long enough that I've had people shop with us in the middle 2000s, have a family, Get to middle age and then circle around again to start. God, you guys are still around. This is yeah, awesome. Absolutely, yeah. I've got people who who are just logging in now that were customers twelve years ago, and it's just really cool that they come back and uh, and are just really happy to do business with us again. Let me ask you this: you're the, you're going to be the first person I've asked this to. I had it jotted down in my notes: perception versus reality. Let's relate it to heel toe. Mm-hmm. You know, what is people's perception of heel toe 
one of them, and then what's the reality? Well, I think they're. I think the perceptions are pretty varied. One perception I think is that we're a big company. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you've been around since O two, but we've been around a long time. The website's fairly well polished. It sometimes is a little bit clunky acting, but just we, don't go to Facebook to get. We're always it to you guys. Right, yeah. Don't go to Facebook. Some yeah. <laughs> <sighs> um, yeah, but I think some one of the probably biggest perceptions is that we're bigger than we are. And then, you know, people's assumptions about a larger company are either, you know, you can afford to help me or you're probably going to screw me or Mm -hmm. any of these things where you're kind of like interacting with a company where, uh, no attention to customer service because you're so big. Well, whatever. uh, Also in our industry, we have a lot of people who are basic, who are not really business people. That's what they're car people. Right. right? And vocational. That's a fact. Yeah, they're vocational people that just made a, a job out of jerking around with cars, which I think there's nothing wrong with at all. That's what I did. Um, but at the same time, um, you have to have an appreciation for what people are expecting out of modern customer experience, right? right. So I try to help people as best as I can, but also we are a really small company. I mean, it's literally me. Elise does uh, support. She does a lot of the accounting and things, but even I do a lot of the accounting. I've had employees sort of on and off over the years, but they've been more help than they've been contributors. Sure. Uh, so as far as the workload goes, a lot of it's just myself. And That's so, the reality then. Yeah, the reality is kind of it's just me shot. and I am. Uh, you know, if the sales dip for a day, I, I take a breather. If they dip for a week, I get a little nervous. Okay. You know, but the trend has been long enough now. I know what to expect. But the reality is that we're not a big company and I do value every penny that comes my way in the form of an order or whatever. And so um, what I've recently learned is it's gotten a lot easier to just sort of give back to people. Um, A guy messaged me yesterday that he got the wrong oil seal for his car. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm looking at it and I sent him the right one as far as what my website said. But when I double checked, the listing is wrong. So Uh, I screwed that up. The little stuff. Yeah. So I said, well, I said, do you want to exchange it or do you want to um, just return it? And he said, well, I got to go get from my dealer. Like, I got to get my car back on the road. And then, I'm, and then I'm reminded, right? I'm not just providing somebody some shoes that they can't wear next week like they wanted to. I'm sending it something to somebody so their car can drive. Sure. You know? and um, Something essential. Yeah, they really do need it. And I can't. Go bring it to them. It's right. somewhere else in the country or the world. So not to be offended by the fact that somebody had to go and make it happen to get their car running. That's that's part of our hobby, right? And if I can't execute right on it in the first place, then I just took the whole loss, all of it, right? Um, so I said, okay, well, you can return it, and then I'll you know refund you, right? I'm looking at the thing. It's $11. So I says to him, like, look. I said, it's so cheap. It's not worth messing with. I'll just right. give you a, a $15 store credit and we'll call it even. I said, there's much more stuff for your car that we have. It's a little bit of a risk, but, sure. you know, because what if he doesn't want the credit? Well, if you piss somebody off, they don't want your freaking store credit. They, they don't want to come back, right? But if you're nice, you know, let's just credit you back for the seal plus some inconvenience and then, uh, you know, throw it in your toolbox or something. Worked out perfect, right? So being able to be generous and not penny pinch every single sale. Guy got a clutch disc that was wrong. Being reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or even really going beyond. Non-automated, yeah. Another quick one. Guy ordered a clutch on the website. He put it in the car. He's driving along with it, and it's not holding the power that his car makes. Now, the circumstance of his car and the clutch that he has, I feel like there's probably something else going on because there's no reason why this clutch wouldn't work for him. But... The entire page that he ordered the thing off of said that it was the part that he was getting, except for one little blip in there, suggested to him that he was getting an upgraded clutch. One little thing, right? And I went around and around with him, and ultimately I said, look, I said, I'm not being resistant here. I'm just telling you, the next time you see conflicting information on our website, let me know before you order it. Let me know before you put it in your car. You know, because 
He goes, well, it's not my responsibility. I said, no, it's my responsibility to make sure the website is right. I said, but I'm only one guy. I have to right. type all this crap in. And if you yeah. see an anomaly, I'd like to fix it before right. you have Let this problem. Yeah. So any little inkling that something is wrong with a listing, I have to take full responsibility. So I'm shipping them in a new clutch disk, no cost. I don't want to do that. I don't feel like I, 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 I don't feel like I should bear all that cost, but ultimately I kind of do. This guy's paying for multiple you. transmission jobs to swap it out. That alone is a sticking point with clutches. I'm lucky that he only wants a new disc. Right. So, and he's been buying for five years. He's a good customer. Take care of him. So you've been doing this for 20 years. It'll be 21 at some point this year. Why, in your opinion, we'll get you out of here on this. Why, in your opinion, do businesses that do what you do typically fail? Because a lot of them fail. I think they fail because they don't have the resiliency and they don't have the, the persistence. They don't have the drive to want to do it right, right? There are all kinds of customers that we have to deal with, all kinds of attitudes, all kinds of um, entitlements. But then there's like a lot of ignorance around what people are doing. People are doing this stuff in their garage. And so they'll come to you with some really challenging customer service type situations. And I think because we're all kind of coming from the same plane and a lot of us are sort of like, maybe a little rough around the fingernails. Right. There's, and a lot of us are dudes. There's more of a, a feeling like we're working against each other or that we know more than the next guy. And so when you're going to lose that battle, when it comes down to betting with money, you're always going to lose to a credit card chargeback. And they throw the hands up and be like, you know what? Screw this. I'm done. People are too dumb. I ain't right. going to handle it. <laughs> well, you know it's what? It's car people and our business people. Because car people aren't business people. Yeah. And car parts customers, they're not buying. These are emotional purchases. Yeah. Highly emotional purchases. And if you can't connect with that, if you can't tap into the emotion that's behind it and understand that when that person received whatever they got, they went to a really high high. Yeah. And if something went wrong, they go to the lowest of lows. And even worse, they might not be able to drive their car, which yeah. is the whole point. So if you can't weather those storms then you're going to give up. Yeah, it's the, my hand, my custom handmade part doesn't fit my car right. You guys, everybody, these parts don't fit. Piece of crap. Um, Marcus, how do people get a hold of you? Well, the best way is on heeltoeauto.com. Are there any hyphens or anything? If it's you, all squished uh, together. No, it's just heeltoeauto.com. It's not heeltoe.com. I've been trying to get that domain forever and he won't give it up. But uh, yeah, heeltoeauto.com. Uh, if you're on your... If you're on your phone, the contact page has a click to call, click to text, and that goes straight to the phone in my butt pocket. <laughs> Is there any social media for it outside of obviously what we've talked about, the crappy page? Yeah, well, we do exist on Facebook, um, but uh, Instagram is a little bit more of a personal platform. Uh, we have a YouTube. I've been trying to work on the YouTube. Um, some of our videos are, are doing pretty well there, too. Really, honestly, email, call, and text is probably the number one. Call me old school, I guess. But people do message through those other platforms. Facebook Messenger I use all the time. Sure. You know, that hasn't – my Facebook presence hasn't been impacted at all. Right. It's just the business page. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, there's many ways to get a hold of us, and I field all of that. Marcus, Mateo. Mateo's over here bored, like, can we get the hell out of here, please? <laughs> Thanks for uh, officially coming into Hard Parking Studios. Yeah, man. I'll be happy to come back if I'm in town. Well, be happy to have you. That conversation, of course, was brought to you by The Cell Shop, an Arizona-based retailer that tries for your destination of choice for wireless services, whether Arizona, Washington State, California, Texas, and Florida. They are an authorized AT&T dealer, so visit them at cellshop.us and get connected today. I want to thank Marcus and his son, Mateo, for stopping by the studio. It's kind of funny regarding Reservoir Dogs, going back to the opening. So my first car was a 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Four-door. My father took it to Mako and got a paint job. It was a weird blue, kind of a lighter blue, and then he got it kind of painted clearish, kind of a deeper blue. Actually, a really pretty color, a popular color now. Uh, not so, Not so much back then, but... I hated the car, but I used the car. I used to be a courier, the kind of courier that goes from one building, a business picks up plans, documents, takes it to another one, drops it off. 
That's what I did. I got paid shit. And the car that I drove only had an AM radio in it, but it had a cassette player. Probably not from 76, but at some point someone put a cassette player in there. So I had the Reservoir Dog soundtrack. I have no idea where I got it. I think it belonged to my friend Tony, who um, I picked up every once in a while because we were that typical, we, he didn't have nothing going on if he wasn't working. So if he was off, that's what we did. All right, man, I'll come pick you up. You know, ride around with me all day. And we just listened to the Reservoir Dog soundtrack over and over and over. Side A, side B. It just became a fabric of my everyday. It's an interesting soundtrack. You should check it out. Had an awesome conversation with Mike Jimenez of Jada Toys. That's going to be coming up in a few weeks. So be looking for that. I want to thank Ray Hunt and Wright Toyota. I discuss the Arizona Foil Online.com. Sell shop wireless services. Patreon business supporter. Kui Automotive out of Warren Garden, Florida. Hell Construction out of Connery, Michigan. Big House, my home design, Ashburn, Virginia. Traverse City, Michigan. Westgate Exotic Cars. Rentals out of Glenda, Arizona. Also shaping success with Wes Tangersley out of Boise, Idaho. Catch us every Wednesday at 7 o'clock Pacific time on Instagram as we do One Drink Wednesday. That's Wes, myself, and all of you. If you're in a position to note the podcast upgrade, you can join the Patreon for as little as $3 a month to get access to bonus audio as well as show swag. Mark Stoneman, Catherine Cox, Eddie Ramos, Richard Graves, Byron Jones, Bo John Giles, Mina, Andrew Buckley are my Patreons. Thank you so much for your support. And if you want to pick up a Hard Parking Podcast shirt, email the show at hardparkingpodcast at gmail.com or just order it from hardparkingpod.com. Follow me on Instagram at jfinning. Join the Hard Parking Violations Facebook group. I can't grow without you telling the world how good the show is. Let's do this. Let's grow this thing together. And I will talk to you all next week. Shut up! (laughs) A beater.